out of 50 states. And you put those two things together, and we're number one out of 50 states for poverty. Not in terms of number of people, that too, in terms of percentage. Once you adjust for our high cost of living, because housing is so expensive in California, one out of four Californians live in the technical definition of poverty. Now poverty around the world means different things. But in America, in our standard, one out of four Californians live in poverty today. And so I look at this and I think, it, number one, it's not fair. Number two, it doesn't have to be so. See, we know how to fix these problems. These problems are largely our own making. You know, policies in our state government are making our state less competitive. So jobs are leaving our state. You probably saw these. Toyota announced that it's leaving California. Like their headquarters picking up and leaving. Other businesses leave. It's not the CEOs and the managers that are hurt by that. It's the men and women that work in that company that are hurt when their job leaves. And then if you look at education, education is such a huge priority for the Indian community for many, many reasons and for long, long history. We have to turn around our schools. And the good news is we know how to do it. There are education models that work. There are schools that are proven that every single child can learn. If they have the right environment, the right schools, the right education, they can get a great education, they can build a better life for ourselves. There's, the only way you break the cycle of poverty is a good education and good economic opportunity because once you break that cycle, that person then teaches their children how to get that good education and it's broken forever. And so I looked at our state and I thought these are huge problems that we know how to solve and that someone needs to lead the fight to turn this around. And I said, if, if someone like me, I'm young, I'm 40 years old, relative to the kids I'm not young, but relative to the parents I'm young. Uh, I'm young, I have a lot of energy, I have experience in Washington working with Republicans and Democrats. If someone like me is not willing to step up, to step in, to try to lead the fight to turn it around, who's gonna do it? And so finally, that's what led me to make my decision to run for governor, and that's why we're here today. The second thing I'll say is the issues that I'm focused on, which is economic opportunity, right? A good education, and a good job, and a fair chance to work hard. These are not partisan issues. Republicans care about these issues. Independents care about these issues. Democrats care about these issues. By the way, every ethnic background cares about the same issues. Be they Indian Americans or Asians or African Americans or Latinos or Caucasians, every family that I've met across California wants the same thing. They want their children to get a good education and they want a good job. And I think that as a son of immigrants, I am able to go into every community across California with this very positive message of economic empowerment. And I believe I can unite people. And if I can unite people around these principles, then nothing can stop us. Because the beauty of this is we are a democracy. And we can make any change that we want to make if we are united to make that change. So I'm proud and honored to be here. By the way, I'm guessing, I don't know this for a fact, I'm guessing I am the only major party candidate in the history of America for governor of any state who's Hindu. I don't think that's ever happened. I'm going to talk to, some, uh, to an Indian group in New York and they said they were very cautious, they were trying to be very gentle as they asked the question about whether I'm Hindu. I said, of course I'm Hindu. I was born Hindu. I am Hindu. And I'm going to stay Hindu. And they were very relieved to hear that. <laughs> but, you know, last week, last week, Christine, my girlfriend, and I went to an African-American church in South Central Los Angeles, a Pentecostal church called the Living Gospel Church. And they welcomed us with open arms. And they, before I went to the church, the pastor asked me, he said, you know, he was being very gentle, and he said, are you comfortable coming to my church? I said, I'm Hindu, why wouldn't I be comfortable coming to your church? That's one of the beauties of Hinduism, is we're very comfortable with everybody else's religions. Uh, and there's no conflict, right? 
So last Sunday, I was at an African American church in South Central, and I delivered the same message: economic opportunity. And they said, "Yes, that's what we want." I said, "I know." The prior weekend, we were at a Latino church, a Catholic church, also in Los Angeles, the exact same message, and they said, "This is exactly what we want." I said, "I know. That's what everybody wants." And so I'm going to stop now, just to say. I think the issues that I'm focused on are not partisan, they're not unique to any race or any ethnic background, they're issues that we can all unite around, and I'm very excited about that. So I'm honored to be here with you, thank you so much for having me, I look forward to working with all of you. So right now we're going to have a question and answer session. If you would like to direct any questions towards Neil, his policies, please raise your hand. I will repeat the question and then pose it to Neil. Please, yes, please. Sure. Yeah, you can come up here. <coughs> Hi, Neil. My name is Bina Bhatia. Hi. And uh, you talked about the poverty and all that. Uh, how much you uh, the familiar with the HMO and the medical of the California. So, I mean... Uh, I will ask you the question. Okay, I don't know okay that's, that's a, uh, somewhat familiar. I mean, I'm very familiar with, at a high level, macro health care policy, but I'm sure there are details of it that you know much better than me, so I'd love to learn. I'm a provider, so I'll tell you, and uh, I uh, specialize in geriatrics. Yeah. If this so there is a major problem. Give it to me. You were in South Central LA, you were in uh, Latino churches. I don't know if they caused this question or not. But as of this year, <coughs> California Medical is uh, HMO. And people are not getting what they used to get from it, which was minimal anyhow. But now it has become, um, as a provider, we got $8. Now people don't even get the two dollars. So how are you going to fix that? Well, the honest answer is we need to look at it. I need to study this in more detail than what you're obviously telling me right now. I will say more broadly that, and this is not directly on point to what you're asking about, but the notion of so many of these government programs that are expensive, there's no question, they cost a lot of money, my focus is on jobs, because the single best social program in the world is a good job. And if we can grow the economy so that there are more good jobs available, you know, my hope, no, no disrespect, I would love to put you out of business. Because we move people into good jobs, they're able to provide for themselves, they're able to get, you know, provide for their own children and work that way, but respond, I'm sure. Uh, I'm not talking about the younger people. There, it's not that much a problem. The okay. problem is with the elderly. I see. And you know that California has the most elderly population after the uh, Florida. And these are the elderly who have worked, they have paid sure, for it. of course. And they are the ones having the problem, the medical problem in the age of Got it. Okay, well, let me look at it and study the issue more. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, anyone else? Uh, Hi, uh, my name is Nishat, and my question is, my question is a little bit, as a high school student, I've experienced with a lot of my friends who do volunteer a lot, and they do and they want to go. Um, they want to go to. Uh, <laughs> they want to work with Red Cross, and they want to go to France and work with Doctors Without Borders, and that sort of thing. And they're very like involved people, but a lot of them have an aversion to politics because it's sort of. It always like feels. They say it always feels like it's curbing them. They want them to like not do this much because it has that. It has that sort of like are you spending too much and that sort of like reach but I feel that politics needs to I need to kind of slow down and, and let the people who want to give to others do but my question is to you is why what would you do to make politics into a more 
accepting open environment instead of the kind of like the for the elderly people, for the higher ups, the rich, the wealthy, only for them. Well, you know, I think there's a perception that there's there's a lot of polarization in the country, as we all know. A lot of people are fighting. People disagree. They fight. And if you look at uh, the U.S. Congress today, it has record low approval ratings. I think it's something like seven or ten percent of Americans approve of Congress. But Congress ultimately reflects the sentiment of the people. And there's a wide range of opinions across America today. We're very divided on a lot of different issues. And that, I think that's just the nature of a democracy. You know, our democracy is imperfect, only it's better than any other democracy that's ever existed in the history of the world. You know, when we had the terrible economic crisis in 2007, 2008, 2009, we went, I worked for President Bush then, we went to Congress and asked them for authority to stabilize the American economy. And that was the $700 billion that I talked about. At a moment of national crisis, Republicans and Democrats worked together. And they moved in lightning speed when we faced that terrible crisis. So I know politics seems very dysfunctional today, and there's a lot of anger and animosity. And part of what I want to do is change that by uniting us around issues we agree on. But I'll also tell you, when it really counts, our democracy works. And people work together, and people get things done. So don't give up. Keep trying. Get involved. Participate. And hopefully we can all make it better together. Thank you so much. We don't need a clap. It's okay. Thank you. Uh, no, 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 it's okay. Sorry, his hand is shaking. Are there? Uh, yes, there is. Oh, the question behind you, too. Oh, right behind you. Oh, behind you. It's such a, it's an overwhelming blue state, right? So, I was saying that California being such an overwhelming blue state, so how you how can you turn it around so the people who belong to this blue color will vote for you? Sure. What are the steps you are going to take? Well, um, if you look at the, speaking about politics for a second, the state of California today is 28% registered Republican. Every year the number of Republicans shrink. A lot of the independents are former Republicans who are upset about where the party has gone. I think I can bring them back because I'm focused on economic issues that we all agree on. There are a lot of issues that we don't agree on, that not everybody agrees on, but I think the issues that I'm focused on, people do agree on, and I believe with a very positive message about lifting everyone up through economic opportunity, we can turn this around. You know, this state, California, has a long history of electing Republican governors be it Schwarzenegger or Pete Wilson or Duke Magian or Reagan, you know, go down the history. There's a long history of Republican governors. Um, and if you look around the country, there are many Democratic states, blue states, that also have Republican governors. And so I think it can be done if you have focus on the right issues and you have the right candidate. And I hope to be that candidate. Thank you. you hope so. Um, okay, so I would like to pose a question. There's a line for me here, so. Firstly, I want to say thank you. Thank, <laughs> thank you so much you. for running and for <laughs> yes. running on um, a very inclusive message, which um, which California needs right now. Uh, Republicans haven't been too popular lately, and um, I happen to be the chairman of the 41st Assembly District, which is where we're sitting right now. And so I think that one of the best things that you can do for Neil and to make sure that he becomes our governor is to participate. So how do you participate? Number one, uh, let's get out the vote for him. Come and see me if you'd like to help us walk precincts or uh, run a phone bank. That is a very important thing for us to do, to help Neil. Uh, secondly, he needs money. <laughs> I know it doesn't seem like he does, but he does. This is going to be a tough race. So I hope that you will support him uh, this evening. Uh, before you leave, and um, here's the meal. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, good evening. My name is Thomas John. I'm from okay. Ghana, by the way. My wife is Matilda. My friend, whom I had just met about a week earlier, Dr. Raj Mandeta, I work for a credit union, so I'm his banker. 
he invited me to this function and I had seen you many times on television and I told him I'm a Democrat. My wife and I have been voting Democratic for the past 43 years since I came to, we came to this country. But from what I heard this evening from you, I'm impressed. Thank you. And it looks like we are about to change our minds. So <laughs> right behind the here. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Mr. Kashkari, I just want to thank you and uh, your beautiful girlfriend for being here today. And I am here with my fiance, uh, Ann Tao, and uh, my name is Dan. We are both educators. And as we have a lot of friends on Facebook where we found out about this tonight, and people like former students and colleagues who are diehard Democrats, like the, our new friend, the gentleman who just spoke. And, and I want to know if you have any advice on how to maybe come across the aisle and, and get those people on board so they will vote for you. Well, I think um, the best thing to do is just be honest. Have an open, honest conversation with people about my platform, the reasons I'm running, economic opportunity, uniting people, lifting everyone up. And I think that those ideas and those messages ultimately need to speak for themselves. And what I tell people is, give us a chance. Give me a chance, give us a chance. And I think if people give us a chance and hear what, what I'm for and what this campaign is about, I think a lot of people can get behind it. So. Uh, I don't have any magic words other than just be open and honest. You know, I'm trying to be as open and honest as I as possible, and then hopefully that's enough. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, can, we, can we have all of you come closer? Uh, Neil is very friendly. So come closer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and Neil, you also move this way a little bit. Then we have more. Of, yeah. Okay. Sure. It's on, it's on. Yeah. Again, I appreciate you coming out here and, and being willing to have us all ask you questions. Sure. So one thing I'd like to ask is from the student perspective. You mentioned that you're very passionate about education and unemployment. I think that's fantastic. When I was a high school student, I saw budget cuts affect my high school in Orange County as our school library was shut down, as more and more teachers were ceremoniously retired. As an undergraduate at UC San Diego, I saw tuitions increase quarter by quarter by quarter. As a graduate student, still at the UC as a medical student, tuition is still increasing. And I see as my friends lose access to educational opportunities, there's major consequences to that. Now, I understand education is something you care about. What would be a strategy that you would implement to actually achieve these goals? Sure. So uh, this is a, it's a complicated question. I'll give you some, sound, some brief answers here. But there are, there's a 30-page education plan on my website, neilkashkari.com slash education. So if you want to read all 30 pages, it's there, but I'll give you the highlights. The highlights are, first of all, on K through 12, on, on K through 12, we spend more than $40 billion, $50 billion in California. And about half of that money actually gets into the classroom. By the time it gets to the districts and the, hold on, we're getting a lot of, Maybe I should take a step back. By the time it gets down to the classroom, there's not a lot left actually for instruction. So one part of my plan is I send the money not to the district where it goes like a waterfall, but right to the individual school site where the parents and the teachers will have control over it so they can decide how the money is actually spent and put it to good use. On higher ed, our universities today are funded per student. There's a, there's a formula, the more students UC has or Cal State has, the more money they get from the state. Well, that actually has a perverse incentive because the universities are not incentivized to graduate kids or to make sure kids are getting the classes they need. The universities are incentivized to collect the students, to literally keep them on campus because if they keep them on campus, they get more money from the state. So one thing we're gonna do is change the funding model so that universities are actually incentivized to make sure you get the classes that you need. Number two, we're going to force the universities to put more of their courses online. Not every course is suitable for online, but many of them are. Now, the university professor unions are against this. Too bad. Too bad. If there's a great UC Berkeley history professor and that course is suitable for online, then that course should be available to every UC student, every Cal State student, every community college student, as a way to open and expand capacity while keeping costs low. So I'll have you, have you read the education plan. There's a lot of detail there. 
But the bottom line is there's a lot that we can do to expand capacity, keep costs low, and maintain very high quality. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Mega Jan, and I was about to ask a similar question, but you also talked about poverty and developing a right economic environment where people feel safe. So what is your plan? Can you possibly summarize that for us? Sure. So, you know, if you look nationally, there's a lot of discussion about poverty. There's a discussion about income inequality. But too often, you know, the root cause, in my opinion, the root cause of income inequality is a failure of education. Because if you get a good education, like many of us, like I was fortunate to have, and the economy grows, you ride that economic growth up, which is good. But if you're stuck in a failing school and the economy grows, you're left behind and income inequality expands. So when you hear politicians of any party talk about income inequality, but not talk about education, it's empty rhetoric, it's empty words. And so step one is making sure that young people, especially the kids of low income parents, get a good education. Okay, that's step one. Step two is, there's so much that we can do in our state to make our state more economically competitive so that businesses stay here. So, you know, if you look in Silicon Valley, they design great new innovative products. Let's just say as an example, my iPhone, okay? Designed by Apple in America, not manufactured in America, right? So we design great products here and then we manufacture them somewhere else. And if they're gonna be manufactured, it's not gonna be in California. So if, if we get our policies right in Sacramento, then we can actually produce things in California and have factories in California, which will employ a lot of people. And that can also help reduce poverty, reduce income inequality. So it's both education and jobs are really tightly linked. You have to do both at the same time. And that's why I'm focused on both. Thank you. great. So um, they kind of go hand in hand. And yes. it's going to work gradually, I'm guessing. There are certain things we can do quickly. Certain things will take time. So education reforms will likely take time to bear fruit. Um, but some of the economic policies, because right now, every day, there are businesses in California that are making decisions where to invest. So if we just tell them and we show them, here's what's coming in the future, we can change some of their decision making right now while those plans are put to practice. And that can turn things around quickly. Thank you. Thank you very much.